So I wanted to walk you through one of the projects that I'm building out in Go just so I can kind of get a better understanding of how Go works and just try to see what can I build doing as little as possible, right? So I don't really have that many external dependencies. I have Tailwind for the styling, and then other than that, I have Go and Fiber. I'm not even using HTMX yet in this project. I'm just doing strictly server-side rendering with templates, but I do plan to bring in HTMX because I do identify a couple of places that would be nice to have a better user experience. Now, before I dive into the project, I do want to give a shout out to another YouTuber, Anthony GG. He has a super kit project, which I actually kind of looked through the code to get my project set up. But he has a pretty good example, like scaffold of like a Go project that has SQL set up and it has a make file that has all this really awesome stuff. So go check that out. I'll put that link in the description. Um, I do plan to probably use this in future projects as well because it's just a, a great way to hit the ground running. All right, let's just go ahead and run this file. So the first thing I'm trying to learn more about is a make file. I've used them a long time ago, but I'm kind of like or familiar with npm scripts and stuff like that. A make file has a bunch of commands that you can run. You basically spin up your dev server, you can build your Go package, you can uh, compile your Tailwind stuff. So for example, I can say make Tailwind and that's gonna go ahead and just run this command here to build and watch my Tailwind assets. Now I will say I do have npm in this project. I do plan to get rid of that. I think the only reason I have like a package JSON was because I wanted to bring in uh, Daisy UI and Tailwind CSS. Other than that, I don't know why I have these scripts here. I could probably remove these and get them in the make file. But uh, again, I'm still learning. So to run this project, you can do a make dev. And that is going to basically spin up my temple watcher, which is going to compile my temple templates. And it's going to run my Go server. And it's going to compile and watch my Tailwind CSS. And then it's also going to restart my Go server if any of my static assets were to be changed. All right, so here's the project again, and it's just using temple for my templates, and then Daisy UI with Tailwind for like the styling. Now I will say this is doing full server rendered, so when I click on a link, it's actually doing a full page refresh. And the app that I'm building is basically a really simple tool for me to import a bunch of emails for a mailing list, and then if I go to the mailer, I can type in a subject, I can type in some HTML, and then also some text. And if I click send emails, that loops over everyone in my SQLite database and sends out emails. Okay, so just to test that out, let's say testing at example.com. I can add that email that got added in. Now, like I said, I do plan to bring in HTMX because if I were to put on some fast 3G throttling and click on this X button, you'll notice that the entire app basically has to reload the page. And then it scrolls me back to the top of the page, which is not a very great user experience just to delete that one person from the current list. Now there's a couple bugs with this project right now. First of all, this whole page is supposed to be behind like authentication. Um, when I try to go to the dashboard, it should kick me off and go to the login page. So I do have a login page here, which again, that's not working either. So I'm kind of confused why that's not working. So some of the things I have, I have this routes folder and inside of the routes folder, I'm kind of doing like a, a grouping type of approach. I would say I'm not doing things the canonical way that Fiber would probably recommend. I'm doing my own thing, and that's a great thing of coming into this new language and framework from the JavaScript TypeScript ecosystem. Um, I can think outside the box a little bit, right? I'm not aligned with the dogma of the Go community, and so I can do things a little bit different that match my needs. So some of the things I'm doing, like I have an auth assert authenticated middleware on the dashboard. So I try to do a little bit of co-location for all my code and also make it so on the dashboard that is responsible for calling more sub views or panels to register the things that are needed. So let's check out this middleware. Uh, Fiber has the ability to do middleware, which is pretty cool. If you're not authenticated, it's supposed to kick me off to the login page. And how do we check for authenticated? We get the current user session from the cookie, and then we check if it's equal to the active user session. So I can actually see right here what the issue is. I think when I get the current cookie, it's returning empty string and I'm defaulting the active session ID as an empty string as well. So probably not the best logic here. I should go ahead and say like user session ID is equal to this. And then if the user session ID is equal to empty string, I could probably just return false. Otherwise I could check and make sure that the current user session matches whatever is stored here. Uh, oh, can't use const there. I'm so used to TypeScript and JavaScript that I've been screwing up my syntax. But um, this is a little bit better logic. Um, basically, I'm doing a really hacky way of just like, I can only have one person ever logged into this site at once. And now if I were to try to refresh this page, it kicks me off and goes to the login page. And now I can type in a password. If it's invalid, it just refreshes the page. 
But if I do type in the right password, which is YOLO, that'll set this cookie session. And then the only person who can ever use my mailing list is someone who knows what that UID is in their session. Okay, so if I were to change this, for example, to a nine, refresh the page, it kicks me out because I don't have the right session ID. So let's just go ahead and log back in. I should get the session ID. You can also log out out there. That logic will delete that cookie. So that was kind of like a middleware. We went on a side quest to kind of fix the middleware issue with the login. Now that's doing good. So how does this work? When we go to the dashboard page, it redirects us back to a dashboard slash list URL. Over here, I'm registering that. And if we were to scroll through this, you'll see that I basically have all of these different calls here to register different endpoints and actions that are all related to the dashboard list view. So I have an action that you can call for adding all the emails. I also have an action over here for deleting the email that you click on. So like if I were to click on this X, that would call this post actions. Again, I'm doing stuff very different than how you might see it. I'm not following the whole like restful approach to things. I'm just doing the things that I think will work best for maintainability. But for the most part, how does the templating work? So if I go to dashboard slash list, that is first of all, just grabbing all the emails from a data access object here. So let's look at this. This is doing a select star from emails. Again, I'm using SQLite locally. Um, I'm not bringing in any type of ORM yet. I may try to explore an ORM soon, but basically I'm just writing some raw SQL queries, getting the results back, and then I'm creating a struct, an email struct, and I send that back. So if you go over here, you'll see that this struct is defined as a type email struct, has an ID and an email. And that's what I return. Basically just give me all the data from the database and I get those emails here and I pass them to a template uh, called email list. Okay, so let's click on email list. That'll take us to our list temple file actually. I need to open the temple file. That's one thing I don't really like about Go is that like when you command click on this, it doesn't take you to the temple file. It takes you to the implementation, which is not useful at all. Like who wants to look at this code? Um, so if there's a way to kind of re re rewire that in VS Code, let me know. That would be much, much more useful. But this is how a temple file kind of looks, right? You have like this function. You can pass in some parameters here. And you can actually use nested layout. So in this case, I have a components package that has a layout function where I can pass in some children. And I can also display a header out here. So that's how I'm kind of doing like nested layouts. And I basically pass in this as my children which has some tabs. So here's another like template. If I go to it, you'll see that we have, oh, that one actually opened up the right temple file. So that's interesting. But anyway, this has some tabs. Um, and based on the current page, I pass in the selected tab, which is a struct. And I just basically use this temple.kv to display an extra class on this, uh, this link. And that's how we determine if we're clicked on the mailer or the mailing list. Pretty straightforward. I mean, it reminds me of like, CLCX in uh, React or Next or the CN package if you use Shad CN. Very similar to that. But some other things I want to point out is typically the way I'm doing all my stuff is I have a form and those forms will always call an actions endpoint. So I have like a unique identifier here and I can usually just find that by just like searching that action. And there we go. Here's the action that gets invoked. So what this form has, uh, for example, if I'm trying to add a new email, it has a text area with a name of emails, and then we have a button. And so when you submit that form, it's going to go to this controller and invoke this action, which basically you can get the emails over here. So c.form value, you get the emails, and then I split all those. So there's a strings package in Go you can use to split stuff. I split it by new lines, and then for each one, I loop over and I add it into my uh, database with this data access.create email. That is going to basically just do a SQL statement to insert into the emails table. I think down here, the statement execute is where I pass into this question mark. So this is like a prepared statement so that you don't potentially have some SQL injection going on. And then finally, I redirect the user back to the dashboard list page. Okay, so like the idea again is I like to co-locate my stuff. So I could probably find the dashboard list by just going over here, um, dashboard list, go to the temple. And this is basically the same page. It'll just refresh. And then kind of similar to Next.js, I mean, when this page reloads again, it's just going to refresh all the emails, rent them out with Temple, and then show them to the user. Now, in terms of uh, what I talked about with adding HTMX, some of the things I want to add HTMX for could be, instead of doing a full page refresh, can we just refresh this section when I add new stuff, right? So if I say test at example.com or like YOLO at example.com and submit that, 
that had to refresh the whole page, not the best. Instead, what I could do is I could have this form call an action. The action could return a template. And that template could basically be a component that display all of these. Same thing with clicking on delete. That could call a delete action, which is going to use a template for this whole list. And then this whole thing could just refresh. I think HTMX also has the ability to just delete things after you click them. So I could say like find the parent of this button and then just remove it from the DOM. So like technically I don't even need to worry about what the backend returns. I'm just going to assume that like this thing worked. Let's just delete it. And maybe there's some type of optimistic updates that HTMX provides, but I haven't really looked into that. So again, we have the mailer. Let me show you this real quick. The mailer, I can pass in some information and click send emails. And let's find actions send email. That's over here. Okay. What this is doing, again, it takes the subject HTML and text, and then it gets all the emails that exist on my SQLite database. And then I create a channel. So this is where I'm going to push a bunch of emails into a channel one by one. And I want to process them at a slower rate because I'm using SES under the hood. I can get some rate limiting. And so basically I just wait every 200 milliseconds. I stop for a little bit and then I process the next thing that's in the channel. Okay. Over here is another go routine where I basically just push all of those email data structs into this channel, which are going to basically be picked up over here um, in process as they come in. And then finally, when this is all done, I will close the channel. Now, I think I use Copilot for generating some of this code, so it might be buggy, but I've actually sent out um, some emails with this and it seems like it works pretty fine. Um, but leave a comment if there's anything here that you recognize that could be made better. Um, the reason I did this is I don't want to do like waiting for it. I want the, the page to quickly refresh and then maybe I can show an alert saying that, hey, the emails are being sent out. So I didn't want to like sit here and do this in a for loop and wait every time because like the user's browser would literally just be sitting here spinning forever. And then finally I redirect back to dashboard mailer so I can find that route over there. And that is going to render out this mailer template, which we can go to here. And this is what it looks like. Again, it's just a form that calls that action and it has some inputs. So that's how I have this project set up. I mean, you guys can critique it if you want to um, and give me some better suggestions of how I th you think I should set this up. I think the way I have it set up works for my needs. Um, some other things I want to point out is we have like a Docker file that I've been using. Now I will say there's some stuff here that I need to improve. Like for example, on another project, I have uh, this building and deploying with Scratch and I was playing around with some other stuff. So I need to come back here and improve this and get this fully deployed out. But yeah, this is all deployed out to Railway and uh, it works perfectly fine. Um, I've actually deployed and sent out an email list using it. So I'm happy with the progress and uh, stay tuned for if I add more features to this or if I decide to tackle something new with Go. I will say so far I'm having some fun just kind of playing around with Go, uh, learning how to use it, learning about the new packages. Like I have my, my migration scripts here that's basically just like a really hacky way to in create some tables if they don't exist and add some constraints on those tables. And then when I deploy this to production, it basically runs those migration scripts, I believe. I think that's all I really want to talk about in this video. Um, but if you want to check out this code that I've been kind of playing around with, go to this URL. I'll put it in the description below. Other than that, have a good day. Happy coding.